point to transition to Jenna and her really valuable work uh, in thinking about accountability and trust in various forms of storytelling. Uh, Hanson shared that Jenna's journey started in more traditional forms of uh, journalism, but actually there was a moment of shift. And I think that's something that you might share today about building trust and accountability in this moment, but by particular tools of storytelling. So I'm turning it over to you, Jenna. Thank you so much for having me. I actually like took some time over the last week to like really think about the question um, that was posed. And I wrote down some of my thoughts in response to uh, in response to that question. So thank you for um, asking me to be here, but also thank you for this format because uh, it gave me some time to think about the context of that question. And, you know, there were so many white people in book clubs <laughs> in 2020, and I couldn't really figure out why. Like, what stories did they miss? What information did they need? Because they were there, they were sitting right next to me. And in fact, the story has always been about them and their violent system. And so I was confused about this seemingly urgent search for information that was already inside of them. The stories they had told themselves, the stories they had told their children, so when I saw the question posed for the conversation and I really thought about it, how can we recreate accountability and trust by storytelling? I thought, is this one of those book club questions? Because I deeply trust the stories that have come through my bloodline and through my blackness. These are stories that have helped me tap into joy. And these are stories that have kept my ancestors alive. And in many ways, I wouldn't be here if I couldn't trust the stories that were passed down to me. So it's the story of my grandparents leaving Mobile, Alabama for New York City during the Great Migration. It's the story of my eighth grade friend, Keisha, who told me that she no longer went to the Limited Two in the suburb just north of us because employees followed her around when all she wanted was a pair of flared jeans. It's the story of my first broadcast news internship where the only black producer told me how to properly pitch stories about black and brown folks so that those stories could get greenlit. It's the story of me giving birth to my first child at a birth center because I didn't wanna be part of the four or five times more likely to die. And it's also the stories that my Asian American brothers and sisters have shared with me, um, specifically about the way in which Asian American women have been fetishized by white men and the places and people they seek to avoid as a result of the history and violence of colonialism. And so we are actually required to trust and hold on to these stories because they are stories about survival. In my time as a journalist within the commercial television news industry, I realized that stories that have been part of my body were reduced to what some would consider a perspective or a side of a story. And if you've been active in any book club recently, then you've probably heard of the term gatekeepers or gatekeeping, folks that control access, access to power, capital, resources, information. Gatekeepers must in many ways uphold white supremacist and capitalist norms or else the system won't survive. So in the world of journalism, there are what I call storytelling gate gatekeepers. They are editors, producers, news directors, public relations specialists, communications directors. They control which narrative are told and they control how they are told. They are also control really what's newsworthy. And so in many ways, they must uphold the narratives that comfort dominant culture and drive demand from consumers. In for-profit and in some nonprofit journalism spaces, I have found those narratives often reinforce white saviorism, individualism, and a lack of analysis of systemic failures. The erasure of US colonial history, just to name a few, this storytelling is deeply invested in the exploitation of black and brown grief and uninterested in the examination of white violence. So I could run through countless examples over my career of storytelling, trust and accountability, but one of the most memorable stories that I've ever covered was the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And I was a journalist in Kansas City, Missouri when I saw the initial images and they haunted me really because the first was a body lying in the street in the middle of a neighborhood just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. The second was a burned down gas station. Now the latter image was a little bit more unsettling because what it symbolized was a city being torn apart by rage, grief, and despair. Michael Brown's blood seeping into the asphalt on a street in his neighborhood was not an image that was unfamiliar to blacks or whites for that matter. 
What was unprecedented in Ferguson was a community that had come apart at the seams, crying for help, a revolt against their treatment and marginalization at the hands of police and local government. So at the time in 2014, my news management, they were skeptical about the death of Michael Brown and the subsequent unrest. And they said that it was not a local story that was worthy of coverage. Once I saw the burning down gas station, I emailed my boss, the news director, no response. I called her. She said, no, this is just another officer involved shooting Jenna. We're not going. So I decided to get to work early and meet my news director when she arrived at work to tell her that these are the same images that we've seen before. We saw it in 1992 in South Central LA in 1968 in Chicago and Detroit. And if we're seeing it again, then we have reached another significant moment in our national history and our racial politics, a moment that needed to be captured by journalists. So she eventually said, yes, I went to Ferguson for two weeks gathering the stories that unraveled after the gas station burned down, but also really trying to understand why news leadership struggled to give us the green light. For her, this was a perspective, a truth that was up for debate because we didn't know the details. We didn't know why Michael Brown was shot. We didn't know what he was doing and if the officer was in the wrong. We didn't know if his hands were in fact up and we didn't know if don't shoot were in fact his last words. But if you learned anything from this last year is that those details are actually not the story. It was only after Michael Brown's death that journalists covered the real story. It was in every paper, on every radio, on every television set. It was the story that the majority of the city knew all along, which was that Ferguson, Missouri, a majority black city was governed by mostly whites. The mayor was white, the police chief was white, the police force was 94% white. Only one of its six city council members were black at the time. This is why the gas station was on fire. White violence, white power, white control, which had historically left black and brown people dead or holding on to and trusting the stories that would keep them alive. So there is trust in storytelling and in fact, it's required. My favorite writer and friend, Brittany Carter, she wrote that the way that crisis in racial capitalism shows up is that people who are typically invisible or unworthy of care are made more visible and worthy of care the nearer they are to death. Journalists were there when the majority black city was controlled by nearly all white people. So you have to wonder why this became newsworthy only in the wake of Michael Brown's bloody body on the asphalt. So maybe the answer really isn't reading any more books and book clubs. All of the information has been there all along. And the trust and the truth can be found in the stories that are required for our survival. So thank you.